Our fool has been Logan said Guatemala. The next Rwanda. Genocide. I mean, why were they doing this? Terror. Best-selling historian Daniel Goldhagen explores the motive. Genocide never happens as a surprise. And explodes the myth. These people had to be eliminated. Behind a crime. It was cruelty that overcame us, me and my fellow criminals. Genocide is always politics. That's worse than war. Worse Than War was made possible by the Pershing Square Foundation and the Einhorn Family Charitable Trust. Additional funding was provided by people here murdered other people hey how go over our tarish yes you can be here if you haven't killed nubwo wabutarishe wagiye mu gitero kishe waragiye urica uje mu gitero kicha abantu babiri batatu uje mu gitero kicha abantu urugamba utarisha abantu cyangwa utarakoze ubufatanye cyabo ubufatanya bwo guha gufata no gutera inkunga abandi bantu ngo bice Can you show me how how you how the person was hacked? Wanyereka se ngo mu buryo ukuntu umuntu yatemwe Okay. I've been thinking and writing about genocide for nearly 30 years. It's something people don't much like to talk about, and about which most of us remain dangerously misinformed. Good evening. A new book called Hitler's Willing Executioners, a highly controversial account of the, the Holocaust. The American Daniel Goldhagen says the excuse of, of only obeying orders won't Notre wash. Daniel, uh, American, a controversial a book about the Holocaust, raising a troubling new question. Were Nazi killers helped by hundreds of thousands of ordinary Germans? They subjected the victims to gratuitous brutality, incessant cruelty. So the picture that emerges is not of reluctant people who are compelled to do what they did, but people who agreed with the program, who believed that the death of the Jews was necessary and just. I've spent my professional life trying to dispel the many myths that cloud people's judgment and prevent us from doing something effective to stop the killing. Genocides happen in every corner of the world to every type of people. The numbers in the past 100 years are staggering. The Turks slaughtered more than a million Armenians during World War I. In the 1930s and 40s, the Japanese killed millions across Asia. In the Soviet Union, the estimated number of deaths in the Gulag camps and beyond is more than 8 million. The Germans slaughtered 6 million Jews and millions more during World War II. In the 1950s and 60s, the Communist Chinese killed an estimated 30 million. And during the 1970s, the Khmer Rouge killed 1.7 million Cambodians, fully 20% of that country's population. Bosnia, Rwanda, Congo, Darfur. 
All told, in our time, there have been more than 100 million innocent victims of genocide, more than all the combat deaths in all the wars fought during that time everywhere in the world. Based on the human toll alone, genocide and mass slaughter are worse problems plaguing humanity than war. We need to understand why. It is a great difficult task you're facing to convey human beings whose behavior seem to defy understanding. And they were beyond belief. In my work, I have benefited from the wisdom of a valued mentor, a scholar of genocide and survivor of the Holocaust. Well, you know, at this point, though... It, By the way, let me just remind you... He also happens to be my father. When the first news of the gas chambers came, the Jewish community was very skeptical of it. Right, but we're in a different time now. Nobody disbelieves that these things that, happen. That's quite what true. What they have difficulty understanding is, is, why, is, the, it is why it happened. Yes. And, and accepting notions that violate their own common sense understandings yes. of the world. There's a certain paradox here because sometimes one accepts very highly, seemingly original and profound theories and something this exp the explanation is relatively simple. I think the actual explanations are, are threatening and unsettling to people. The notion that ordinary people would willfully butcher other people, torture them, including children, slaughter them, is a very disturbing notion to people, particularly if they're looking upon people whom, with whom they yeah, identify. And so they seek explanations which are more, I wouldn't say more comforting, but less threatening to them. Less as early as I can remember thinking serious thoughts, my father and I have been talking about these things. As a scholar, he journeyed into the darkest chapters of the human experience seeking to understand not only what happened, but why. Now I am continuing the journey he began, a journey that, in a sense, I have been on my entire life. People need to understand that nothing is inevitable about genocide. It boils down to a series of choices. Leaders choose to initiate the killing. Ordinary people make a conscious choice to participate. And those with the power to prevent or stop it choose to do nothing. I study genocides because I believe the more we know about how and why genocides happen, the more we can get political leaders and ordinary people to make different choices. Imagine if one day people in your neighborhood were dragged out of their homes and killed in the street. You would want the killers stopped and punished and you would want to know that it would never happen again. Why should it be any different when the victims are somewhere else? Like the people in your community, each genocide victim is an individual, a father, a mother, a daughter, a son. As a scholar, I spend most of my time in archives and libraries. But over the past year, I traveled to these somewhere else's, the sites of some of the worst mass murders of our time. I spent decades studying Nazis and the Holocaust, genocide, but I never been in a gas chamber before. I started my journey mindful that there has never been a time during the past century when our planet was free of mass murder, including now. For five long years, Darfur has been a scene of devastation and destruction. 300,000 people have died and two and a half million have fled their homes as the Sudanese government has tried to crush a rebellion against its rule. The plight of Darfur has moved people of conscience around the world and has only intensified my desire to know more. 
to see the places where the horrors have happened, meet the people who were there, and ask the kinds of questions you have to ask, even though sometimes you may dread hearing the answer. When the genocide began, what happened to you? Genocide and your, and your family. She said her dad was killed like the, he was, you know, chopped, he was cut with a machete. And the mom was chopped, the way she's saying it, she was chopped with a machete. And the brother was also... Who killed her family? Were these just local people who lived here? She says they were, they were neighbors, more to that they were even friends to the family. In genocide after genocide, these are the questions that continue to be asked. How do neighbors end up turning against neighbors? Why do the killers kill? Here in Rwanda, more than 800,000 men, women, and children were killed over the course of three months. Most were ethnic Tutsi, murdered by members of the Hutu majority, face to face with machetes, clubs, and guns. Hitler's gas chambers did not kill with such deadly efficiency. <laughs> When people killed the victims, did they try to kill them as painlessly as possible, or did they try to make them suffer? I find it hard to understand, and I want to understand, how people could approach other people who are begging for their lives and screaming in pain, and chop them. It's a, very, it's a very tough question to answer, because they have the same flesh like yours. Ellie's word cruelty could not be more accurate. Cruelty is at the heart of genocide. The killers don't just eradicate the targeted people, but brutalize them in ways that far exceed what is needed to kill them. 
I see the evidence of such cruelty everywhere I go. I came to Guatemala where a massive effort has been underway to literally uncover the truth about the government's mass slaughter of 200,000 indigenous Maya during the 1980s. Outside Guatemala, few people even know about the genocide. Do we know, is this a, a family or two families or they're adults? In these hills, the Guatemala military conducted a scorched earth campaign against Maya and leftist insurgents. The Mayan people, they said, were inherently subversive and an impediment to progress. The government's strategy was summed up in a grim aphorism of the time. To kill the fish, you have to drain the pond. Here in the mountain hamlet of Plan de Sanchez, they drained the pond on July 18, 1982. Y ahí the military would separate the women and the men. Sometimes they would take the infants out of the women's arms and simply smash them on the ground, kill them right there in front of everybody. They cut tongues out. They opened pregnant women's bellies and dashed fetuses against trees. They burn people alive. We know this because there were people who, even in the midst of this mayhem and mass killing, somehow managed to hide behind a door underneath a pile of corn husks and watch. Ya no pudo retirarme más lejos, ahí me quedé escondido. Pero ya eh, viendo eh, ya los Eh, digamos, cuando ellos van en, eh, están entrando en la casa, sí, esta es el lugar donde, donde yo, donde está, donde está la, el, el, el chorro de donde es, yo estuve, cuando el ejército entraron ya a la casa de mi hermana, y ahí, en ese lugarcito, me quedé durante todo el tiempo matando a, los, a la familia. Sí. Desde aquí escucharon los gritos de las mujeres, de los hombres, de los niños cuando lo, lo empezaron a, a, a matar. Los bombardearon, lo metrallaron, ya cuando Terminado de matrallar, rociaron la casa y, y le pegaron fuego. Only once I got to Guatemala did I realize how remote these mountain villages really are. Government leaders call these subsistence farmers a threat to the well-being of the country. But they did not pose a threat to anyone. The Guatemalan perpetrators obliterated one such community after another.
no moría a los pobres y le agarraron los niños, se agarraron y, y los mataba así, en la cabeza, y después le tiren allí. Las fueron es, apartando las patojas y lo fueron a encerrar en otra casa para violar después de matarlos a todos los que fueron reunidos. Cuando estoy trabajando con fosas de donde hay niños, esto es mucho más eh, representativo para mí, eh, porque inmediatamente comparo la edad que tienen los cuerpos de los niños que estoy recuperando con la edad de mis hijos. Y bueno, pues le tengo que dar muchas gracias a la vida que mis hijos no tengan que vivir en una situación como estos niños eh, hubieran quedado ahí. Everywhere I go, the faces of children haunt me the most. I have children too, and it's hard not to think about them as I hear stories, over and over, about the cruelty children suffered. Which is one of them where they killed around 177 people, most of them children, and uh, the other is women, so there wasn't a single adult male. Uh, so which can, at, you know, it lets you understand that these are not combat deaths. Oh no, you, you know, it's very common in, mass murders for, for the perpetrators to do this to children. Okay. It happened in Rwanda, in the Holocaust. Freddy Petrarelli, a Guatemala native raised in America, is in charge of collecting and cataloging the bones. They portray a message. When they do this, they're also killing the seed of evil, according to them, whether it be in Nazi Germany or whether it be in Guatemala in the 1980s. Well, this is, this is the bone lab, uh, the forensic anthropology laboratory. Freddy is amassing a record of the atrocities committed by the Guatemalan perpetrators and providing the victims' families with remains to bury properly. The bones hold the story of what happened to a person during their life and might even tell us what happened to them during the event of their death and even what happened to them after death. So here, for example, we can see how... And if you want, I'll allow you to feel the difference. So you can see, this is a very sharp cut. And if you run your hand through it, it's very, very smooth. Mm -hmm. See, That was caused by a machete striking the right side of the head and also cutting the atlas. And you see, when you match it up anatomically, you can see that this trauma here right. is related to this strike here. And basically what they try to do here is decapitate the person. Now, what we've seen usually is that these people were not very knowledgeable of anatomy, so the decapitations, as you'd expect, were not always successful. So you have repeated blows to the head. Somebody's trying to separate the head from the body. Very typical of overkill. And uh, sometimes of even crimes of passion. Overkill. There's a word I don't think I'll ever hear the same way again. Uh, in these cases, if the killers were simply doing their duty to wipe out an insurgency, as they claim, they would execute their victims quickly and be done with it. You have to wonder why we see so much evidence of such murderous passion, especially against women and children. This is a child here, a very young child. I wouldn't even dare to tell you the age, unless what the anthropologist is working on the case. And you can compare, this is the first rib. Wow. So, and if you compare this, to that one, you can see the difference. I mean, the first rib is about that big. So this is a very, very small. If, just holding a no, tiny and, little bow, you know. Yeah, see, I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't think there's a, a way of humanly understanding this because it goes beyond what I believe humans can do. But obviously, I mean, the more I say that, it, the more I understand It's hard for it. me to, to, I to believe that you're saying this, given what you Because I want to I wanna believe that we're not capable of these things, even though I want to believe that this is wrong. So doing this has to be wrong. If I accept that this is right, and if I excuse it, then I'm, I can't do this anymore. Freddy is not alone. Most of us find it hard to come to terms with the capacity of human beings to do such horrible things to others. But we have to make sense of it. As irrational as they seem, these are not the acts of crazed individuals. These are people who know what they are doing, believe it's right, and make a conscious choice to act. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm Daniel Goldhagen. Yeah. It's many errors. 
Bitte? Es ist ein Nice to see you. Ich habe ein Ehrenbuch. Das Lied hier. Dieses Lied. Ja, es zittern die morschen Knochen der Welt vor dem großen Krieg. Wir haben den Frieden gebrochen. Für uns war ein großer Sieg. Wir werden weiter marschieren, wenn alles in Scherben fällt. Denn heute gehört uns Deutschland und morgen die ganze Welt. Ja, es war voll. Und ich habe das mitgesungen. Ich habe das genauso mitgesungen. Ah. Und die haben mir nicht damals in der, bei der SS... Können Sie das immer noch singen? Nein, du wissen Sie, Sie, das ist aber wirklich eine Frage. Also das Bitte? Ist, das ist eine Frage, ob ich das singen könnte. Das ist das, was Unmenschliches, ja. Like most Germans, Otto Ernst Duschelig grew up with a worldview in which he saw himself as a member of the master race, while many others fell into the category of subhumans or Untermenschen. When you were in school, yes. when you were in the Hitler Youth, yes. what did you learn, for example, about Untermenschen? What did that word mean to you? Yeah, ja, Untermenschen. Und der Menschen, das waren für uns die Russen, die Polen, Zigeuner. Zum Beispiel waren das auch Menschen, die meinetwegen äh, geistig behindert waren. Ja. Lebens- und Wertesleben. Ja, auch die. Das waren nicht wert, die hatten keinen, äh, die do, 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 sollten nicht mehr weiterleben, Sie wissen das ja selbst. Ich meine, ich denke da an das Tagebuch von der Anne Frank, ja, wie sie geschrieben hat in ihrem Versteck, Menschen, die dazu gebracht werden, andere Menschen als minderwertig oder als, als, anders, als äh, anders aussehende und anders denkende Menschen als minderwertig an, schließen sich durch ihre Haltung und ihre Worte selbst aus der Menschen, menschlichen Gemeinschaft aus. Und war das das Hauptproblem hier in Deutschland? Während der Nazi-Zeit? Ich glaube nicht nur in Deutschland. Aber nicht nur, aber auch. Auch, ja, ja. Dass wir den anderen nicht den Menschen gesehen haben. It's striking that it is a former SS man, invoking Anne Frank, who makes this point. It is an important one. It is that failure to see the humanity in others which makes it possible for the killers to commit their crimes. I would add that it's the belief that those others are dangerous enemies which inspires the perpetrators to kill with such zeal. Years ago, I encountered an episode of the Holocaust which spoke volumes about the willfulness and dedication of the killers. And I got to know one of the survivors, Lily Silbiger. I have a map here with me which actually outlines the route from Helmbrecht to Volari. Here is Helmbrecht. In the last months of World War II, as the Allied forces neared the concentration camps housing Jews and others, Germans emptied their camps and drove their prisoners on forced marches through the nearby towns and countryside. The death marches left a trail of corpses in their wake, and the marching prisoners were described by more than one witness as the walking dead. These are actual photos of the young women who were with Lily on the march. On the summer day Lily revisited the route of the death march with me, the countryside was beautiful. But in the spring of 1945, it was cold and bleak. Lily's guards actually had received explicit orders not to kill any more Jews, but they willfully defied their superiors. They drove her and the others, starving, wearing nothing more than rags, day after day through the frigid countryside. Sometimes we wouldn't even get food for 24 hours, for 48 hours. People resorted to anything that was found with it, anything rotten that was, you know, you just grabbed at anything. 
Um, and you were 16 at the time. Yeah. And um, in one place, someone broke into a pantry or some place where we arrived and stole some loaves of bread. And for that, they selected um, 50 girls and killed them over a mass grave there. We had to come back and uh, cover them. And there were many of them still alive when we had to do that. So they, you had to help bury them alive? We, we, we had to do, we had to put, yes, the earth, cover them with the earth. With earth. Uh, so this was the biggest um, horrible, you know, period. One of the astonishing things is that they were marching the Jewish prisoners literally to the last day of the war. Instead of running away to avoid capture, they stayed with the prisoners. They continued to deny them food. Absolutely. They continued to beat them. They continued to kill them. They continued to do it to the very end. We knew the Russians were closing in there, and then we heard uh, artillery, some planes flying all overhead, we heard some bombings in the distance, so we knew they were very close. They managed for such a long time to keep ahead of the Allies, going in, in, in nowhere, you know, to a place to know, just to drag us, just to... Um, just go in circles, actually. That's what was happening. They didn't know themselves what they were doing. They could have easily left us wherever we were and just disappear, and they didn't. They believed the Jews were evil incarnate, an enemy of humankind, a threat to the well-being and future existence of Germany. And if you believe that, just as if you believe someone's about to attack your child, you'll do anything you can. Yeah. Each of us tries to make sense of the horrors in his or her own way. Over the years, I have talked with many who grapple with these issues, but never one more thoughtful than a man I met in Rwanda, Tarsis Karugarama, the country's Minister of Justice. Here we're speaking now as two people trying to understand very difficult set of circumstances. The ways in which victims were not just killed in, if we can call it the least painful way, but were hacked to death were tortured. The zeal and passion with which the perpetrators sought out the victims, it's not easy to find people hiding in the countryside. Mass hysteria is very difficult to explain. People reach a period when they're involved in mass hysteria, when they can no longer be accountable for their actions. But you certainly don't want to take that as a legal position, do you? No, definitely not. Definitely not. I'm just trying to explain, because I've been around in this judiciary for some time now, and I've met all sorts of contradictions. So the one you're talking about is a major contradiction. The brutality with which they did the killing is shocking. What, once people had stepped beyond the first step of actually killing, throwing a child down and hacking them to death, opening the womb of pregnant. There's nothing that was left that they couldn't do. Because they were being told by the politicians who are giving them the alcohol, that if you don't destroy these people, these animals, these, they are coming to finish you. None of you will survive. And they had been made to believe it. I don't want to be a to give an excuse for them. They are willing killers, there's no doubt in my mind. But see, at the back of their mind, the radio is telling them they are coming to finish you. If you don't kill them yourselves, their plan is to finish you. In Massachusetts, I live just a few miles from a large community of Cambodian Americans. 
Many of them are survivors of the genocide that took the lives of 20% of Cambodia's population during the 1970s. One in five Cambodians. It is a chilling statistic. In the spring of 1975, a communist rebel group, the Khmer Rouge, conquered the country. They wanted to turn Cambodia into a Marxist agrarian utopia, which to them meant destroying virtually all vestiges of modern civilization. First day when they marched into the city, we were so happy that the war ended. We were joyful and we saw the soldier came, there was peace come, and no more fighting, no more war. And then suddenly everything just disappeared. I saw a lot of soldiers in black uniforms close to my home. The soldiers spread everywhere, shooting guns in the air and, and asked, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Within three days, Khmer Rouge cadres emptied Cambodia's cities, forcing millions into the rural camps they called cooperatives but which came to be known to the outside world as the killing fields. Think about about two miles per day, three miles per day that we could move because of so many people. And along the road, there were bodies along the road everywhere. It just, it just, the scene is just awful. The extent of their violent transformation of Cambodian society still boggles the mind. And it was all begun by one man, known as Pol Pot, supported by a small inner circle. Genocide is always the decision of one leader or a small group of leaders. These individuals make a choice to initiate the killing, which in every case means they could have also chosen not to. The leader's goals vary depending on the time, place, and circumstances. Pol Pot wanted to radically transform Cambodian society. The Turkish leader Mehmet Talat wanted to secure Turkey's decaying empire. Adolf Hitler wanted to create a vast political empire ruled by the German master race. Colonel Theonist Bakasora and his fellow Hutu leaders wanted to secure political power in Rwanda for the Hutu. And in the Balkans, Slobodan Milosevic wanted to permanently redraw the political map of the region. Genocide is always politics. Of course, there are political goals. Those political goals can be reached in different ways. Some people think that exterminating a group would help their goals. So that's why they do it. Slobodan Milosevic thought at that time that he could, because of the overwhelming military power, make some territorial gains in Croatia and Bosnia. So he attacked. The fulfilling of their mission was to make a greater Serbia. In order to make greater Serbia, you had to exterminate people in your way. Serbia is right there across the Drina River, and lots of Serb-controlled territory in the central part of the country. They wanted to link those two zones. Right? But if you had large, a significant number of Muslims along the eastern or the western banks of that river, you had a kind of barrier between those two Serbian areas. So these people had to be eliminated. These things are done in, in cold blood. This is a design, this is a, a plan, uh, this is a calculation, of course. This is, this is not uh, a reaction to something. This, is, this, unfortunately, here is a planned genocide, as is any other genocide, because it's not possible to kill a big number of people without uh, prior preparation, mental preparation, intellectual preparation, military preparation. President Sologic is right. 
There's a misconception that genocides erupt spontaneously out of deep-seated passions or ethnic conflicts. But there is nothing spontaneous about genocide. In this villa in the suburbs of Berlin, the Nazi leadership discussed their detailed plans to exterminate the Jews of Europe. These typewritten minutes document the meeting and list country by country the 11 million Jews they planned to kill. One of those was Eric Goldhagen, the 10-year-old boy in what was then Romania, now Ukraine, who would grow up to become my father. The Nazi victory would have been tantamount even worse than, than it would be like a nuclear war almost. The destruction would be is perhaps more easy, easier to recover from a, from a nuclear assault than it would be from a Nazi victory. I've asked him to join me on part of my journey, to return to where he lived during the Holocaust. So have you talked to mom about our trip to yes, Chernobyl? Yes, she is very enthusiastic about it. She encourages me to go. You know, mom is always someone and believing. She believes that the past has to be preserved and remembered. And uh, she has helped me overcome my uh, natural reluctance to go. You know, when I told her that she had to work on you, she said she never works on you. <laughs> I knew, but I knew, does, but I, knew I had an ally. <laughs> a very subtle way, you know, she works on me. All you have to do is to envision what would have happened if Hitler had won the war. There would be mass graves everywhere, a vast concentration camp, and what I call in Greek a necropolis of city of death. And even Germany itself would have been transformed. But what most Germans don't understand is that Hitler would have done to Germany things which even the worst enemy of Germany wouldn't have done. He would have destroyed the Christian churches, destroyed the churches, killed the insane, and above all, and this is the important point, he would have converted the younger generation into a race of barbarians. There is a widely held misconception that the Germans' efficiency and technology, the trains and the gas chambers, made it possible for them to kill so many so quickly. As we've seen in Rwanda and elsewhere, leaders do not need sophisticated technology to kill on a vast scale. It is the will and not the way that is critical. In Rwanda, the Hutu leaders did what all genocidal leaders do. They tapped into the prejudices and beliefs that people already held. Generations of Hutu had grown up being taught that the Tutsi are dangerous and inhuman. It was easy to mobilize Hutu for the killing. Hutu 
In Bosnia, there was deliberately a paranoid culture created prior to the war, about five or six, seven years. There was a propaganda of uh, the Serbs being threatened by everybody else. And I know people who, because of this propaganda, good people, who genuinely believed that they are somehow threatened. So they have to attack in order to defend themselves. As Hutu leaders did in Rwanda, the Serb leader, Slobodan Milosevic, played on beliefs his followers already held. His rallying cry was one that most Serbs would easily embrace. Under his leadership, Serbs would reclaim the land that they believed were historically theirs, including the predominantly Muslim country of Bosnia-Herzegovina. He exploited centuries-old animosities toward Muslims, whom the Christian Serbs saw as their eternal enemies. What they're being told about Bosnia is about Muslims. They are a threat to them. Why does this make sense to them? Because it's in harmony with the national, nationalist myth that many of them have been fed for generations, and the labelings of the victims that they uh, violated during this activity fit that myth. When those harboring powerful hatreds finally are given the chance to kill, their euphoria is unmistakable. In Bosnia, the Serbs' plan was comprehensive. It was described widely as ethnic cleansing, a euphemism that trivializes their brutal acts. They rounded up Muslim men and put them in concentration camps or murdered them outright. They expelled families from their homes and from regions which they wanted exclusively for Serbs. And in the capital city, Sarajevo, they attacked the civilian population from the surrounding hills. Bosnian Serbs fired 12 mortar and artillery rounds last night into a part of the city crowded with young people. The sniping activity here was notorious. People so, walking down the street were hunted like animals. So what would have happened to us if we had been here? We would have been shot from those buildings over it's there. Far the, uh, away. I mean, the, no, no, that's not far at all. I mean, a sniper could have could yeah, yeah, us yeah, right yeah. here. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a hard shot from, for a trained sniper. And these were trained people. They were not, uh, you know, they were not yahoos with 12 gauges. These were high-powered hunting rifles. There was high-powered sniper rifles with very sophisticated uh, sight equipment on them. And you know, it's, you'd be banged with a headshot. You could walk across this street in broad daylight and nothing would happen. But then, like bagging prey. Were they just as likely to shoot women? Yes. And children? Yeah. So it had nothing to do with you being a soldier, no. per se? No. So what was, I mean, what was the function? I mean, why were they doing this? Terror. Get rid of the Muslims. Yeah. 
And so terrorize them, kill as many as possible, yes. make them suffer as Push much as, as many possible. of them into as small an area as possible so they can seek the rest. They knew everything. They prepared everything. It was really actually planned and systematic, actually systematically planned, the war of uh, actually establishing concentration camps, uh, killing, uh, raping, everything. Raping is one of the worst crimes. It not only humiliates the person, it destroys the family. Mm -hmm. you, uh, there is uh, so many cases of unwanted children. The, the mother doesn't recognize her son or her daughter that came from these rapings. The Serbs' widespread raping of Bosnian women was not the kind of thing, as many think, that happens inevitably in war zones. They did nothing, actually, has done anything. Like killing, the Serbs used rape and rape camps as an integral component of their campaign to rid the country of its Muslim population. We will never find out how many women were raped all over Bosnia. They actually closed us in some big rooms with maybe 14 beds. They are yelling at us. You will have Serbian babies, Serbian children. They were beaten, horrible beaten, with face, with actually their legs and horrible. There's a lot to make sense of here. It seems to me we've been missing a critical point in understanding these horrors. The masterminds of genocide use different means in varying combinations to get rid of unwanted people. They expel victims from their countries, they herd them into camps, they rape women in an organized way, and of course, they systematically slaughter. So what we often think of as genocide is never just about killing. What the perpetrators want most of all is to eliminate a substantial part or all of the targeted group. Terms like genocide or even mass murder are inadequate to describe the phenomenon we have repeatedly witnessed. As a political scientist, I live and work in a world of isms. This one we should call eliminationism. Reframing the way we think about these deeds is not just an intellectual exercise. It's a critical component of understanding that genocide is one part of a larger phenomenon that we must combat. We need to be on alert when we see any form of eliminationist politics whether it initially includes killing or not. Everywhere it is practiced, eliminationism takes different forms. Rwanda was different from Bosnia. Cambodia was different from Turkey. The Germans' assault on the Jews was also different. It was the only case when perpetrators targeted every adult and child without exception for annihilation. And where that murderous policy extended to country after country, including Jews half a continent away. So it's 64 years yes, since you've been back, yeah, right? Yes, that's right, yes. And, and I feel the sadness as I come back to this place where I was almost killed, where a great part of my family lies buried. Had you, had you ever, had you planned one day to come back on your no, own? No, never, really not. Uh, probably would have never come back had it not been that you were making this film. So are you, a, are you a reluctant, if willing, participant? An ambivalent participant, I would say. The Jews in the region where my father lived were killed in most cases by the Einsatzgruppen. Mobile killing squads charged with exterminating every Jew in the Soviet territory conquered by the Germans. They killed with brutal abandon.
Is there any? Is there a positive side for you to go back? Showing me the places you you were. Yes, showing you, showing showing you the places because you have been sort of an academic, very secluded, uh, and, and never. Uh, for the first time, you 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 are who have studied this phenomenon from the past, from the from a, from a distance through documents. Come now, you've you've seen the. The mass graves in Guatemala, and you certainly should have a look at the mass grave of some of your relatives. Where am I buried? There were two thousand Jews in this town when my father used to visit his relatives here. Now there are three. Most lie in a mass grave. Near what is now a popular picnic site. Like my father, I have always endeavored to separate my emotions from my scholarly work on genocide. But here we are, at a moment that I never imagined. A local man has agreed to guide us to the site where Germans murdered my father's relatives and two thousand others. I see, I see, I see, I see. see. Or cool. well, here we can go close. The scholar's job is to stand back and analyze, but the survivor and the son have no choice but to draw near. To the eternal memory of the Jews of Kosov who were murdered by the Nazi murderers and their helpers. So how many people from your family are lying in this mass grave? I would, or the, or I, the I, I would estimate that over a dozen people. Were you close to them? Did you know? I was them very close to them. I visited them here, uh, and it evokes in me certain emotions. The images of some of my relatives appear before me. I, I see them now. As I speak to you now, I see them. And sometimes, as you may remember, when I gave the course on the Holocaust at Harvard, I experience sometimes a sense of guilt at the fact that I speak so coolly and analytically of the death. I'm your son in many ways, uh, and your dispassion is my own. How, how did they die? What happened here? Well, they brought them up here and killed them by gunfire. One group fell into the grave, then another group was lined up, they fell into the grave. When they were shot? When they were shot, until, and many of them were probably not killed. Many of them were probably not dead. They were alive as they fell into the grave. And Ukrainian groups were made to cover the graves. You know, as we've often spoken before, it's shocking to me to reflect on how detached I am, too, from this, that I didn't even make this obvious connection that we were going here when I was in a mass grave in Guatemala. But now that we're here, I realize that suddenly he, my relatives murdered sit below us, lie below us, unmarked, unknown, barely registered in any way, their names absent, soon to be forgotten completely. Should we get some stones, Toddy? Yes. Perhaps it better to put them in
Well, certainly we thought that we were saying never again, but we keep saying never again, over and over and over again. Well, there are two different issues. Why does it keep happening again? And why doesn't anybody do anything to stop it from happening again? And it keeps happening because there are political regimes that find it useful to deal with their self-defined problems. And it's a very useful tool. They do it because they know they have basically impunity. And there has been very little calling to account. And they get away with it time and time again. So quite clearly, the status quo is catastrophic. And when I say catastrophic, I mean literally catastrophic because it takes the lives of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions upon millions of people. And so never again is a hollow phrase. It's well meant. But in the world of what actually happens, it's been a hollow phrase, a mockery of itself. The inaction of world leaders in the face of mass slaughter goes back well before the Holocaust. And genocidal leaders have taken note. Starting in 1915, the Turkish government killed at least a million Armenians and expelled hundreds of thousands more. The story of the Armenian genocide was covered on the front page of the New York Times. And Turkey's leaders were explicitly warned by the US and others that their nation would be condemned by the world. But the masterminds of genocide were undeterred. The Turks brazenly destroyed communities, killed, raped, and drove the Armenian people into the desert where they starved to death. For a century, Turkey has refused to acknowledge the genocide. And remarkably, many around the world, including the U.S. government, have allowed them to do so. The Armenian Genocide is the only genocide uh, that we have trouble recognizing, and it's because the campaign of denial continues to this day. Our government is flat out wrong in their refusal to recognize the Armenian Genocide. We must call genocide by its name. We can't have the kind of leadership that we need and stopping genocide going on today if we're equivocal about the murder of other people because it might offend an ally. I should think that it would be a no-brainer that a resolution would be passed to acknowledge this. What's the problem? Well, it should be a no-brainer. Uh, as it is, it's an enormously difficult challenge. Uh, when the genocide resolution was in committee uh, last fall, uh, the President of the United States was on the phone calling committee members at their home to urge them to vote against it. For this resolution? For this resolution. We all deeply regret the tragic suffering of the Armenian people that began in 1915. But this resolution is not the right response to these historic mass killings. The problem that we have is that this is clearly a very sensitive subject for one of our closest allies. You had members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, calling members. You had the Secretary of State calling members. Uh, I've never seen a full court press like this on any resolution. I don't think we strengthen our relationship even with an ally when we turn a blind eye to some of the worst chapters in human history. Our politicians may fail to learn from history, but there is ample evidence that mass murderers have learned quite well. The Sudanese president, Omar al-Bashir, has been accused of masterminding a campaign of genocide in Darfur. 20 years the before the recent crisis in Darfur, the same Sudanese government killed and expelled even more people in southern Sudan. After killing two million then, the Sudanese leader, Omar al-Bashir, learned that the international community would let him do it again. Why does the international community fail to intervene time and time again? As our report emphasizes, the choice we face in trying to prevent genocide is rarely a case of all or nothing. Uh, there is a broad range of foreign policy options between standing aside and ordering in the Marines. The co-chair of a recent task force on the subject, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, served as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations during the Bosnian and Rwandan genocides.
You know, if one is simply naive, one sees a world of powerful countries, usually looking on with some ineptitude at best, at countries that are poor, not very powerful, in which their leadership is slaughtering people. And you wonder, how can this be? If you go to people and you say, you can prevent mass murder, uh, then most people will think, okay, I'll do the best I can. The problem is that world leaders uh, or leaders generally are distracted. There's so much to do. It isn't as if they're not doing anything. There's no way to describe to someone that it has never been in the U.S. government or any government how many things are happening every hour and require attention and require will and require resources. The question is whether your governmental system is set up in a way that you don't have to start from scratch. You know, we can talk about Rwanda where there are many different players involved and people had different degrees of knowledge at different times about what was going on. It seems that there was a clear lack of will, not good will in the sense, of course, people didn't want the people there to be slaughtered, but will actually to take the sacrifice or make the sacrifices See, I necessary. Disagree with you. The Belgians pulled out. Uh, Dallaire was, a, I mean, you know the story. Dallaire was 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 crying out for more for more support. Maybe not everyone could have been saved, but a lot of people could have well, been saved. Well, I mean, this is an issue that weighs very heavy on all our hearts. We were at the same time dealing with Somalia, Bosnia, Haiti, a few other things that were going on, and I think that people did not fully understand all the Hutu Tutsi rivalry and the internal things that were building up. That I think was something that had not been paid enough attention to. It is much easier ex post facto to say we knew these kinds of things were going on, but at the time I was ambassador at the United Nations and I can tell you that the information was not there. I don't know what kind of information Albright needed, but even more than during the Armenian genocide, information about the Rwandan genocide was available to anyone with access to TV or newspaper as there were multiple sources of information coming straight from Rwanda where everyone knew. As soon as the killing began, many Tutsi, including Emmanuel Gatari, made their way to a technical school which was being protected by UN peacekeepers. As the lives of Emmanuel and the others with him hung in the balance, the U.S. and other foreign governments began to evacuate their citizens from Rwanda. And there were so many people who had run to the UN for security, for protection. And they withdrew and left them there to be massacred in cold blood. This is really something that the UN should be able to explain. How do you withdraw? People are supposed to protect people at a time that is so critical, at a time when you see, because the killings had already started. To 
twuzura hose ari huzuye abantu abantu barahangaha ahangaha iyo mpageze keshi na keshi ndaza nyigitwa garuka icyo mbona na na mashuri abantu bari bahari na mashuri abantu bari bahari bari barahangaha turakomezanya A lack of information is not the reason world leaders fail to intervene to stop genocides. The problem is a lack of will. For more than half a century, people around the world have expected the men and women here at the United Nations to protect them. And time and again, the UN has let those people down. I look around at the many states here that have terrorized, oppressed, and eliminated their own people. And I think, why would anyone look to this body to combat these evils around the world? In 1948, the United Nations adopted an anti-genocide convention that legally defined genocide and authorized its member states to stop and punish acts of mass murder. The document is noble-sounding, but totally ineffective. It has never once been invoked to prevent the death of a single person. There is a fundamental problem here. The UN exists largely to protect state sovereignty, a state's right to be immune from other countries intervening in its internal affairs. So how can we expect to also promote intervention when a sovereign state and its people are eliminating killing, raping, and expelling groups of its own citizens. I don't see sovereignty negatively as a concept of barricading yourself against the world while your people are suffering. I see it as a positive concept of the state discharging its responsibilities towards its own citizens, providing them with protection and assistance. And if, for lack of capacity, you cannot do it, call on the international community to come and help you do what is your responsibility in the first place. You know, I, I applaud what you do, and I agree. And I also very much like reconceptualizing concepts the way you have with sovereignty. But you're in a minority there, as you well know. Absolutely. And even in this hall in particular, you would be in a minority if you were to stand up and to give a speech here. And it seems to me that sovereignty is an important principle, but we should make clear that it does not go so far as to allow governments Absolutely. to slaughter their people, and that that in itself, those acts in itself, abridge sovereignty. And if you do not discharge your responsibility and you don't welcome help, you have no will, we will take other measures. And these other measures we need to develop to be a credible threat. But uh, meanwhile, I'm just doing what is in my capacity to do. And you're doing it well. Thank you very there much. are well-meaning people here to be sure, but I'm afraid they're part of an institution that is set up to fail. The UN is not the solution, as its appalling record shows, but I do think we can design a system that will effectively stop or prevent future genocides. The first component must be swift diplomatic intervention. A recent episode here in Kenya may offer a promising model for the future. What was once one of Africa's most stable democracies is right now one of the most violent places in the world. Extreme chaos following a disputed election in Kenya. Mobs torching a church with hundreds of refugees inside. Witnesses say dozens of people, including children, were burned alive or hacked to death with machetes. And there are new fears today that Kenya is in danger of becoming the next Rwanda. In January 2008, a spate of killings followed the re-election of Kenyan President Miwai Kibaki. 
clearly I think that the immediate trigger for that violence was the disputed election results that happened. But beyond that, I think there were also other underlying issues that came to the fore, issues of discontentment, issues of marginalization, rifts between eth ethnic groups in the country, issues of land, issues of historical injustices. So all these things came up together. And I think that the, the election results, the way it was handled, the process, was really like the match that was thrown into the barrel of oil. <laughs> In the Rift Valley, members of the president's tribe, the Kikuyu, were targeted. 1,500 or more were killed. Hundreds of thousands were expelled from their homes. If the Kikuyu had tried to hold their ground, would the violence have escalated to produce Absolutely. deaths on a massive scale? Absolutely. I think the killings would have definitely increased. I think it would have drawn in also more communities. Within days, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan had flown to Nairobi, along with representatives of other African countries. I think it is important that all Kenyans respond with sympathy and understanding and not try to revenge. The U.S. Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, arrived soon after. They came to mediate, to pressure, and with threats of sanctions. I don't think I've ever seen in Africa such intense international engagement on an issue, and that, that, that really helped. The long-term effects of the diplomatic intervention in Kenya remain to be seen. The violence stopped, but the racist and political roots of the conflict run deep, and Kenyan political leaders could start up the violence again. But the immediate response of world leaders was a powerful statement and the kind of rapid reaction that could save many lives in the future. Diplomacy, of course, does not always work. The UN is accusing the Sudanese government of resuming bombing raids against rebels in South Darfur. And it also says that displaced villagers like these are still being attacked by Janjaweed militia. When the Sudanese government was murdering its own people in the western region of Darfur, world leaders sent envoys to Khartoum. But the oil-rich regime cares little about world opinion. They continue to kill, and the world has done nothing meaningful to stop them. We need to stop proving to political leaders that we will stand by as they slaughter their own people. If diplomacy fails, countries committing mass eliminations, such as Sudan, have to be kicked out of the UN and all international organizations. And all trade must be cut off. Leaders that continue to kill must know that we will swiftly and forcefully destroy their military capability. Some people have talked about some kind of rapid response force. I, I would, of course, be for intervention, military intervention, when people are being slaughtered. And it seems quite obvious that having some kind of force that could intervene rapidly and effectively in many of the countries where it doesn't take a great deal of force to stop these things is an absolute moral and political necessity. Some would say that if we're going to intervene militarily in Darfur, what about Congo? Certainly more people have died there in the past 10 years. So perhaps then you sh you're suggesting we should intervene there as well? Uh, these kinds of arguments I also find unpersuasive. Uh, it is quite true that the United States is not the policeman of the world, even though it is the guarantor of much of order in the world. It remains that. But that doesn't mean that if intervening in Darfur is the right thing to do to save lives, that we should not do it because we can't intervene everywhere. I don't find the arguments, again, persuasive that, well, you shouldn't do something because you can't do everything. Our problem is that we do little or nothing at all. The international community must have a mechanism that will quickly react to a genocide. There is no waiting there, there is no other consideration. Human life must, must be saved. We must all agree to this. If there is mass killing somewhere, the international community has the right to intervene. It's, well, you know, when it becomes too late, it's too late. 
in many instances, diplomatic efforts are going to be unsuccessful, particularly once the killing starts. Uh, the only way you are going to stop that is through the use of military force. But it's going to be very difficult to get a wide consortium of countries to agree that there's an automatic trigger for military intervention. In Darfur, you need African governments on board, you need Middle Eastern governments on board. This has proved very difficult to accomplish. You know, I'm not a diplomat. And I say, why? Why do we need them on board? I mean, you have, you have hundreds of thousands of people being mm -hmm. slaughtered. Why do we need to get Middle Eastern governments or African governments on board? Why not create a no-fly zone? Why not mm -hmm. bomb their military installation? Forget about the diplomacy for a minute. Sure. Would it be effective? And then how do we weigh, if it, is, if it would be, the morality of it versus the diplomacy of it? From the moral perspective, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we do have a moral obligation. If we're in a position to act, um, and we have the actual capability to do so, then I think we should. But if you have a situation where you're not able to get support of other governments, it may be counterproductive. Getting the support of other governments sounds good. But as Harris Sologic experienced during the days of the Bosnian genocide, convincing leaders to intervene militarily is extraordinarily difficult. What was it like for you trying to mobilize the international community, the political leaders of the European countries, of the United States, the UN, and so on, to do something? Oh, that is very frustrating, the powerlessness. Very frustrating. It's hard to move the international community to really do something. It's a philosophy of uh, the least resistance. Let's do the easiest things in the world. So let's wait. Maybe it will go away. As we have seen time and again, when we wait to intervene, problems don't go away. They only get worse. This is the story of another mass murder that didn't have to happen. By the time it did, the elimination of Bosnia's Muslims had been going on for three years. The outside world knew what the Serbs were up to, we knew we could stop it, and day after day we chose not to take effective measures. In 1995, the city of Srebrenica, designated a safe haven for Bosnian Muslims by the United Nations, fell to Serb forces. Within days, the Serbs killed 8,000. Each year, some of the victims exhumed from mass graves are positively identified and given a proper burial on the anniversary of the massacre. As Srebrenica fell, the Muslims sought refuge several miles away at this factory complex, which served as the headquarters of a small UN peacekeeping force. had 25,000 people, many of them elderly, women and children, gathered in the yard around this base seeking protection. I, mean, I think at that time there were approximately 300 Dutch troops there, far, far below anything that would have been a credible um, deterrent to any kind of military action on the ground. After they captured Srebrenica, Serb soldiers under the command of the notorious mass murderer General Ratko Mladic arrived at the UN base to deal with the Muslim refugees. <laughs> After a night of terror, the Serbs announced that they were going to be transported to friendly lines and buses. Don't be afraid. They brought cookies for children. <laughs> The 
the Serbs separate the military age men and what that meant was pretty much anybody 12 and above to one side and then the women and children and the older people to the other. S jedne i s druge strane čekali su nas poredani četnici koji su bili naoružani svim mogućim oružjem. Oni su nas odmah dočekali i rekli su mom sinu da ide desno a da ja idem pravo. Međutim, mi nismo ih poslušali. Ja sam vukla svoje dijete sebi u tom vremenu dok se to sve događalo. Ja sam njih molila, molim vas, nemojte mi otimati. To je moje jedno jedino dijete. Ja ga više, oni su ga odveli. Bio je taj neki mali ko mrak, tako je bio. Ali kad sam se probudila, progledala sam, dan je bio. Ja sam tek tada počela da plačim i shvatila sam da sam ja prvi put u svom životu prespavala noć, a da ne znam gdje mi je djeć. This is how easy it would have been to save the lives of Sabaheta's son and 8,000 others in Srebrenica. In early morning raids, more than 60 aircraft from as many as five nations pounded air defense missiles. And in August 1995, two months after the expulsion and mass murder in Srebrenica, and three years after the genocide began, NATO forces began a bombing campaign against Serbian military targets. In just three weeks, the bombing changed Milosevic's calculations. In short order, Slobodan Milosevic was at the negotiating table discussing the peace treaty that would end his depredations in Bosnia. The Bosnian genocide was over. Let's turn the clock back. What happens if in 1992, NATO started to bomb and not waited until 1995 to do so? Oh, that would have stopped everything. Definitely. We would have saved the lives of 100,000 people? Not only that, the credibility of the international order, the credibility of justice, the credibility of humanity, that would have been saved. Perpetrators of elimination almost always act with total impunity. Here in Guatemala, a genocidal mastermind walks freely. In fact, he continues to serve in the country's Congress. At the time this killer committed his crimes, he believed he would get away with murder. So far, he's been proven right. Él eh, gobernó Guatemala entre el 23 de marzo de 1982 y el 8 de agosto de 1983, de una cantidad de masacres en el país. Entonces se le busca por genocidio. José Efraín Ríos Montt led this country for nearly two terrifying years, during which he was responsible for a widespread campaign of terror and slaughter. I wanted to get a look at this man in person, and I hoped Otilia Lux Dakoti, a member of Guatemala's Congress, would help. Hi, nice to meet you. Genocidio es la máxima expresión de lo que es el racismo. Era prácticamente eliminar todo lo que concernía a los maya, dado en que los indígenas lo consideraba el ejército como un un pueblo que estaba prácticamente apoyando a la guerrilla. 
fue realmente degradante. Fue, des, de, fue para nosotros un comportamiento eh, deshumanizante, ¿no? The Rios Montt plan for 1982 was called Victoria. And these are plans that lay out the broad strategy of how the army was going to destroy communism and wipe out the guerrillas. And the plans are very explicit about the need to go into the Mayan communities and destroy them. They contain operational orders to go into certain villages, which were, in fact, massacred and razed. And after action reports, in which the commanders of those units say, duty done, we've, uh, we've, we've completed the operation. And the villages, um, what are the, some of the words they used? Well, eliminated, the village is eliminated, the village is, is neutralized. Otilia looks to Cody as taking me into the halls of Congress where the former dictator maintains a powerful presence. In the rough and tumble of politics, the congresswoman works side by side with the man responsible for the murder of nearly 200,000 of her people. Hay una cuestión política, Daniel. Nosotros somos políticos, yo soy política. Y tengo que hablar con Dios y con el diablo. Para negociar una ley, hay que hablar con todos. Seeing Rios Montt in this setting is surreal. It's like encountering Hitler in the Bundestag. I have studied mass murderers for more than three decades, but it never occurred to me that I might one day stand before a genocidal mastermind face to face. The UN laws and the international codes have a concept for genocide. Está establecido en qué consiste el genocidio. It's clearly defined. Eh, al terminar una etnia. Uh, when you're going to eliminate an ethnical group. Terminar una religión. When you're going to eliminate a religious group. Un grupo específico. Or a specific group of people. Y al, alguna otra otra ocurrencia. La cuestión es eliminar algo que se opone a una norma. The definition clearly states is eliminating something. The, the definition states eliminating in whole or in part an ethnic group which the Mayan people were. Él dice que la definición dice que eliminar parcial o totalmente un grupo étnico, sí. como las personas mayas que viven en Guatemala. Sí. He agrees with that. So you were you responsible for this? Quiere saber si usted fue responsable. Si yo fuera responsable estaría preso. He would be in jail if he was responsible for that. I don't know what I was expecting, but not this. The former dictator was evasive and combative, but remarkably, he stayed to talk for more than 20 minutes. Do you accept the Historical Commission's finding that 200,000 indigenous Mayans were killed while you were president by your military? Que lleve las pruebas y que me acuse ante cualquier tribunal. He said that you should take proof and accuse him in a court of law. Staring into the eyes of this killer, I feel outrage and disgust. But more than anything, I am reminded that all of this comes down to a choice. More than 25 years ago, as the political leader of his country, this man considered his political goals weighed his options, decided he could get away with it, and made a calculated decision to murder and expel hundreds of thousands of his country's people. The question is, can we get future leaders to make a different decision? I think we can.
you know, Danny, you might be suggesting we can prevent one of the few things in the world that people say are unstoppable or that we haven't seen to be able to stop. Do you think people will just say, come on, Danny, that's, that's not going to happen. It's not just one person. Right. We've been screaming about these issues for a long time, and the leaders of the world haven't listened. The political leaders who kill other people are often hate-filled, possessed by ideologies that lead them to see groups of people as necessary to slaughter. But they are not crazy. They are rational calculators of costs and benefits. After all, these people have risen to the pinnacle of power in their countries. And so what we need to do is think about their cost-benefit calculus. Like Rios Montt, all political leaders who initiate genocides and eliminations know that the international community is unlikely to interfere with their deadly plans. This is case number IT-95518I, the prosecutor versus Radovan Karolich. We have international courts, and they do some good, but they are unbearably slow and ineffective. Good afternoon, Your Honor. And the killing continues. So what should we do? From the tragedies in Rwanda and elsewhere, we've seen that the institutions we rely on to combat genocide don't work. And it's clear that, as in Kenya, timely intervention can get political leaders to stop the eliminationist assault. In dealing with a recalcitrant genocidal leader in Darfur, we've learned that, to be effective, intervention must often be forceful. And that, as was the case in Bosnia, relatively little force can achieve extraordinary results. And we know, above all, that genocides are political and they are initiated by a few leaders whose cost-benefit calculations can be changed. We need to change that calculation. Do we need to have a new international orientation towards intervention in genocide? Definitely. How would you rewrite the rules of, in of the international community on this? First, Genocide never happens as a surprise. Never. The signs are usually available and apparent. And so, there should be a debate at the UN Security Council, at the level of the European Union, at the level of African Union or other poor blocs, to say under which circumstances intervention would be deemed necessary. So you don't wait until it has happened. So there must be preventive measures. So I think we should go back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board, indeed. Given everything I've seen and studied, this much is clear. Instead of the UN, we need an international watchdog organization made up of democratic nations that will enforce a zero-tolerance policy on genocide and eliminationism. Each of the members must have the right to intervene individually or collectively to stop campaigns of elimination. But intervention, even forceful intervention, is not enough. By the time we intervene, tens of thousands can be dead or homeless. We need an effective system of prevention. We've got to stop genocides before they happen by showing political leaders that the cost to them will, for sure, far outweigh the benefits. The U.S. has a bounty program for getting people to hunt down terrorists. Why not have democratic countries do the same for leaders who perpetrate genocides and eliminations? Let's say, for example, the international community declared the leaders of countries that commit genocide to be outlaws. They can be hunted down until they either give themselves up or until they're killed. Would Milosevic, under these circumstances, have ever initiated the slaughter of Bosnians? I don't think he would. He, 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 he counted with the powerful friends and most of all with the de facto situation on the ground, knowing that the international community is in love with the status quo. We must show that it doesn't pay. If people knew 
that the, at the end of the day, they'll be the losers. They'll never invest in a losing enterprise. It's because genocide, it's a political game, it's a power play, it's worse, it's everything. So if people involved in knew at the end of the day they would be the losers, they would not play the game. That's for sure. What is the alternative to dealing forcefully with genocidal leaders? The status quo, more mass murder, more lives destroyed. The key to stopping genocide is to focus on the leaders. The key to getting us to act is to identify with the victims, to think of each one as if he or she were your daughter or son, your sister or brother, your mother or your father. Now we're going to tee into Car... Car... Carmen? I don't know how to read it. My journey ends with my father at the place where his began. Shortly after the Germans and the Romanian allies entered my father's town, they slaughtered 800 Jews. My father and his family were nearly executed on a dirt road behind their house, somewhere in this neighborhood. Do you see any tracks? Yeah, they should be straight ahead. We end here and the tracks should be right down here. Here they are. Tani, see yeah. the tracks? I don't know. Do you see them? Yeah, they're right there. I see. Yeah, that was here. I lived right here. I ran out with my father beyond from there. Out the other side? Yes, I remember we ran over a fence, and as we were running, a soldier spied us and beat my father very severely with the butt of his rifle, and put us against, said, wait here, put us against, uh, towards, uh, there was a fence against the fence. And then he told me to tell the family to come, to come out. So he sent you back to the house? He sent me back to the house, and we saw neighbors standing beyond this railway and we realized that they're looking at us in a certain way that they in an ominous way uh, they were which didn't which didn't bode well to say the least now that we're here is this, well, you has see, this changed your the, view the, po the point is that the scholarly element the scholar will then immediately takes over the the, the, and overshadows the, the uh, emotions of the survivor who revisits the scene of his near death. So that as you, I talk to you, I begin to reflect, draw historical analogies and so on. So therefore, it has a certain tempering effect upon my emotions as I confront this house where I lived, the street where I walked, and reflect it on, the, on, on, my, on my blood lying in the, in the, in the dust here. But when I remember that moment as I walked, and I just couldn't believe. Yes, I did reflect upon how I would lie dead. What does it mean to be dead and to lie in your blood? I remember vividly this imagery that I had as I walked. And What must it feel like for a 10-year-old boy to contemplate his own imminent, violent death? Or a 16-year-old girl? Or a 19-year-old man? What must it feel like to be imprisoned in a rape camp? Or to watch helplessly as members of your family are killed? Or as your people are decimated? What must it have been like for the men of Srebrenica who were herded into this warehouse? Or for the others forced at gunpoint into nearby fields to be executed? Yes. 
We can't stand by anymore. People are dying every day. A few political leaders start genocides. A few political leaders can stop them. The presidents and prime ministers we elect have the power to end impunity and change the choices potential mass killers make. We must hold our leaders accountable and demand that they bring an end to genocide and eliminationism. Thank you. How do you say thank you? I never remember anything. Asante sana, everyone. I had been working on Worse Than War for about 10 years before the film project began. When I write a book, I can pretty much say whatever I want to, and if I decide something needs 20 pages of elaboration, then I do it. Even though I had thought at the beginning, well, I know what this film should say, it turned into something quite different and infinitely better than anything I would have produced had I been the filmmaker. Because I probably would have produced a nice two-hour lecture of some kind with visuals instead of a film that is visually arresting and emotionally evocative. And as powerful as the book is, in some ways obviously more powerful. When my father and I went to where he had lived during the Holocaust, Sarah, my wife, and Gideon, our son, came with us. Gideon at the time was seven years old, and he was deeply interested, very close to my parents, they lived nearby. He was deeply interested in going to where Grandpa was from. So they came on the trip with us, and, and it was something that made my father enormously happy, that one of his grandchildren could see where my father came from and where, and where he suffered and where his family suffered, it made the trip if one can say such a thing, twice as moving and, and memorable and meaningful for him. There's no doubt that my father influenced my initial direction of working on the Holocaust, but it's less because he was a survivor than he was a professor who studied this. And I grew up with this material in my home, always with the purpose, not of telling a tale of woe, which it is, but of understanding and explaining. This was always my orientation from the time I can remember knowing or thinking or about it or discussing it. But it changes you to see the places, the cliche, a, a picture's worth a thousand words, only begins to convey what being in a place and sitting across from the victims and seeing the locations where people were slaughtered and being in a forensic lab with the remains of victims or being in a mass grave or standing across from a mastermind of genocide such as Rios Mont, it, it changes you. It's, it, it is more than worth a thousand words. It's worth endless, endless volumes of words. In Rwanda, we gained access to one of the prison camps. It's actually a work camp for prisoners who, who confessed to their crimes, or at least some crimes, to confess to having participated in the genocide. If you can believe that, there are about a thousand people in this prison, there are no guards. 
So we interviewed the perpetrators in the field. The warden just brought people to us. We had no idea who we'd be talking to. And also we walked among them. They were tilling the ground with hoes and picks and machetes, clearing it. And you're walking among them within, within feet of rows of them wielding these implements, and you can't but think. These are the implements they use to slaughter their victims during the genocide, by the individually, by the tens, by the hundreds, by the thousands, ultimately. Okay. Tell me one. Shaking the hand of a killer, before I even know anything else about him except for what his name is, is a strange thing. It's an act of politeness. It's, uh, it's a time of human sharing. And yet that same hand, I shake the hand, I think the same hand actually was wielding a machete and striking and killing and hacking to death other people. And you can't flinch. And you can't say, I don't want to do it. And you have to do it because it's part of what you need to do when you interview somebody. And that's just the beginning of sitting across from someone who then begins to tell you of the horrible things, the horrifying things that he did, the ways that he did it. And so there I am, a whole jumble of emotions and thoughts and, and different orientations at the same time. The interviewer, the scholar thinking about what he says, the analyst, the human being sitting across from a mass murderer, feeling a degree of sympathy or even of liking for someone, because some seem likable. And also, always keeping in mind that these are mass murderers. To be able, in making this film, to go to any number of countries and to talk to the victims, to talk to the perpetrators, just to see the places I'd read about was transformative. And I think back on the people quite often I talk to. They resonate with me, their faces I see. In the film, my father and some others talked about seeing faces. They're haunted by them, or they remember them, the faces of the people who died. Well, the faces of the people I spoke with and their words are with me. In the way that the, the testimony in, in, in documents, in court testimony, and so on, never are with me. I hear them, I see them, I think about them. I absorbed and internalized things into my being that were never there and that will never leave me. Worse Than War was made possible by the Pershing Square Foundation. and the Einhorn Family Charitable Trust. Additional funding was provided by Worse Than War continues online. For more resources, information about the phenomenon of genocide, and excerpts from Daniel Goldhagen's book, visit pbs.org. The Worse Than War program is available on DVD for $24.95 plus shipping. The companion book is available for $29.95 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-336-1917.